So we left the village and went to the wilderness, and we waited for a couple of hours so that uh, they'd stop uh, firing over over the the village, but it never stopped. I know we're not gonna get to everybody in time. I I hope two days ago I said I was concerned about that. Now I know we won't get to everybody. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on over 30 cable stations from Vermont to New York City on the internet at thestruggle.org. This week, an account of what drove a community of Palestinians into the wilderness and then into Lebanon nearly 70 years ago. Then conditions in flood-ruined Puerto Rico and news about UNH and Saudi Arabia and the Take a Knee protest. Finally, a farewell to a beloved New Haven activist. On September 21st, two Palestinian women spoke at Central Connecticut State University. They are living as exiles in Lebanon. Uh, so we're going to start with the stories of Musa. First of all, you have to know, guys, that Musa was born in 1933 in Kabri village in Palestine. In 1938, her father, who was a freedom fighter during the British occupation, was assassinated by the British occupation. In 1948, she was uh, uh, expelled from Palestine along with her family and all the villagers uh, in Cabri. In 1982, her, uh, four of her children were killed by the Israeli army during the Israeli invasion uh, to Be of Beirut. And now, in 2017, she's here with you sharing or trying to share uh, some of her stories. So I'm going to be asking her about how life is was in Cabri village. She's going to describe it for you. I'm going to do and then um, she's going to tell you how they were expelled and how they lived uh, in refuge uh, in Lebanon. And then she's going to try to share with you the, story, the parts or the part about uh, her uh, children getting killed because she doesn't always she's not always able to say those stories. Um, I'm going to do so by asking her some uh, questions in Arabic, and I'm going to translate what she says in Eng uh, into English. Yalla, Haji. Yalla, tafadhal. Ahki li kif kan shakelha qariyat al kabri? Abil ma tatlaou minha? Kanat qariyat al kabri, qariyat na madziye, mktfiye zatiya, aishim be ahad salam. Kabri village was a modern village. Uh, it, it, people used to depend on themselves to live. We used to live peacefully there. It's part of district of Akka or Akri. Some houses, the houses in, Akka, in Kabri, some of them were old, built old, and others were more modern. Can't we have you? حجر أبيض هاب طعوم من الجبال بسموه حجر سلطاني بنحطو نحية. So the people in order to build their houses used to get the bricks from the mountains and uh, the brick was called Sultan and they used to build their houses using that brick, these bricks. كان فيها بيوت كم يعني بسيطة. The houses were mainly simple. كان فيها نبعة مي. There was also a spring of water. Called Ain uh, al-Asal or uh, Spring of Honey or Honey Spring. We had very good relationships with the Jews who already were there in Palestine. Next to us, uh, there were three settlements which was uh, next, so close to the Lebanese borders. One of them was Hanuta. Jwella. <coughs> and Masuba. They were our neighbors. And to the west, we had another settlement, a fourth one, Naharia settlement. 
We had very good relationships. We would go shopping at their settlements. They also would come and buy from our products. I still remember there were three doctors. One of them is Natan, the other one is Kiwi, and another one called Mariam. Those doc we used to go to, the, to these doctors all the time. At that time, my brother-in-law got engaged to a, a, a woman from uh, Lebanon. At that time, we had no uh, cars or vehicles, so we had to transport the bride over the camel. <laughs> we passed, while coming back from Lebanon with the bride, we passed through a Masuba settlement. The settlers in Masuba, who were basically Jews, they stopped us and they they insisted that we have to have lunch with them before leaving to our back to our village. So they prepared lunch for all of the fam the two families. And just before, after we finished lunch and before leaving, they just got us all kinds of products they had, and they gave them they gave them to us as gifts for the bride and the groom. They even walked with us uh, all the distance back to Al uh, Kabri village, which is 40 kilometers, and they even attended like uh, the wedding, and we had so much fun at that day. So what what actually happened that made us uh, or forced us to leave uh, uh, the village was between the Zionists who came, not between the local Jews. There was a farm that was basically on the borders of our village. Uh, it was an ancient farm. There was a very old building in that farm or a castle. Uh, and it, it was like, um, we don't know exactly um, when it was built. So the Zionist troops wanted to go and take over that farm, and they claimed that it, it was theirs. But we refused to let them in and take over the farm. So uh, they said we're going to use force in order to, to, to take over it. And that's what, uh, why or how we decided to stop them. Since the farm had a castle or a, like a, a very ancient building there, we did not want them to take over it because it was so old. So we told them we're not just going to let you take it. But uh, after we insisted that we're not going to let them go and take over it, the uh, British army came and they, uh, said, uh, they said that we're going to let you uh, take over this farm uh, in, by force and under our protection. Someone came to the village and told uh, the chief of the village that the, the troops, the Zionists and the Br uh, British army are coming to take over this uh, farm by force. So we decided that we have to protect that farm, especially that there were no set settlements next to that farm. So uh, what we did after we knew that they're coming to take it by force, Everybody in the village, like men, women, children, everybody head to uh, the road leading or connecting Akka uh, uh, with our village, and we just uh, um, put ev like blockade. Yeah, blocked, blocked the uh, blocked the road. We so that we can we stop them from going to uh, the farm. And that's when a battle between us and the troops uh, broke out. We were able to actually stop them from uh, coming into the uh, into the farm, and uh, everybody of the the troop they were all killed. Uh, the the very next day, the British army came. They took all the de the killed um, uh, men, and they kept the trucks that were fired, uh, or we turned fire in them, uh, just right at their places. At the same day, uh, at night, at 10 o'clock at night, they started bombing our village. The Zionists used the same uh, area that um, the British army used in order to bomb the villages near us. They destroyed most of the village during that bombing.
people did not expect this to happen. We didn't have any shelters or anything like that. We have no weapons with us. So we left the village and went to the wilderness and we waited for a couple of hours so that uh, they'd stop uh, firing over, over the, the village, but it never stopped. The local Jews uh, already told us or warned us that we were not uh, going to be able to um, help you or protect you from the uh, Zionist or Haganah army. Everybody just uh, tra ran away. Uh, many people, we had nothing with us uh, but our kids. Some, some people even forgot their babies back at home. Until we reached uh, the Lebanese borders. We reached the Lebanese borders, but the Lebanese did not allow us to go into Lebanon. So we basically stayed in Palestine, but by the Lebanese borders. And at that time, nobody was there at that, like the, Israel, the Zionist army was not there. We stayed in the wilderness, we had no houses, no tents, and we had no food, no water. So we had to, wor to walk uh, like a day and a night, sneaking back into our village to get some food and get back to where we, we were hiding. We, uh, we stayed for a while like doing this, sneaking into Palestine or to our village and going back home. But then uh, the Zionist army found out and they stopped us. <laughs> and they blocked all the roads. At that time also, we would wait for the Lebanese people to start harvesting uh, the grains. So we would wait for the Lebanese people to harvest their grains and then hide until they finish. And then we would go after they leave and just uh, take the remains of the, of the grains. My father-in-law did not like that because we had, he said that we had our lands back in Palestine and we had lots of wheat and grains back home and I'm not going to stay just like this, you know, waiting for, peop for, for people's remains. Yeah. So he decided that he's going to go back to, Pal to, to his village and, uh, and this, like sneaking because he knew the, the roads. My uh, father-in-law and his brother and another like um, seven persons who, who lived with us decided that they're going to go back and sneak back into Palestine. They succeeded in reaching their house and they were able to take some of the, uh, of the grains there. While returning back home, uh, it was so dark at night and it, it got really cold. So they started up a fire and, you know, just sat around the fire to, to get themselves warm. They, they, they were just sitting there and then they found out the, a big army, the Haganah army, just uh, surrounding them and holding the guns up to their uh, heads. They told them to hold, uh, raise their hands up in the air and then they started shooting. Uh, they were all ten. And the same person that I was, I told you your, his story earlier, my brother-in-law who got married to a woman from Lebanon, he was also with them with his bride. So, but the, my brother-in-law and his wife, they were just walking like by themselves away from the group. So they did not get killed. They were the only people who did not get killed. So they, did, they were only 17 or 18 years old. So they got frightened. And they had nothing to do but to run up, to run back, uh, to run away back uh, to where they, to where we all were hiding. Many kids died during that time, the seven months that we stayed between the borders because of fever and illnesses and diseases. Some of them because of starvation, others uh, because of cold weather. It was like we were just basically in, in the middle of the forests or wilderness and, you know, it got cold and we had nothing to hide. <laughs> Out of the people who got killed, we only knew four of them. Who, one of them was my, um, was my uh, father-in-law and his brother and two others were our neighbors and the, si the other six, we just didn't know anything about them till now. <laughs> So this is the story of my village, and this is some of what we went through. An account of their experiences in Lebanon in a future program. Now to Democracy Now! reporting on Puerto Rico. 
we start with the mayor of San Juan. I know we're not gonna get to everybody in time. I, I hope two days ago I said I was concerned about that. Now I know we won't get to everybody in time because we have to canvas home by home. Uh, communications is very, they're very spotty. So we have to literally canvas house by house by house. But what I would ask is not only for Puerto Rico, for the entire Caribbean that has been hit so hard with this. Do not forget us and do not let us feel alone. That is the San Juan mayor, Carmen Yulín Cruz, who has spent much of her time in the water trying to save people. You see her with a, um, uh, with a jacket on, uh, um, going from sometimes up to her waist in water. Um, our guest today is uh, Professor Yari Marbonia. Can you talk about the mayor? I, I've been really impressed with, with the seriousness with which she has taken on her role. I feel like when she speaks, you can tell how challenged and daunted she feels and, and how hard she's trying. And, and she said repeatedly that her biggest fear is that not even her biggest fear, because she knows it. She knows there's people they're not going to be able to reach. There's people right now who don't have insulin. There's people who need their medication. There's people who have run out of drinking water and are trapped in high-rise apartments. Um, I said in that piece, Puerto Rico was already in a state of emergency before the hurricane hit. Already double the poverty rate of the poorest state in the United States. 45 percent of the population is in, in extreme economic risk. And these are folks who live paycheck to paycheck. I mean, there's people like to talk about the huge amount of folks on government assistance. But in addition to that, you also have a huge class of working poor who live in gig economy, who live in paycheck to paycheck, and they have not, a lot of them have not worked since Irma. They've not received a paycheck. So a lot of people are really frustrated because you can't get money out of ATMs right now in Puerto Rico, and that's certainly a concern for huge amounts of people. But there's people who have no money to withdraw because they have not received any income since Irma. And so right now, when all, all that is available is a scarce amount of food and water that you can purchase only in cash. Um, there, there's a lot of people. While all this was going on, the Trump administration was talking about taxes, tax cuts, and how they're going to help the middle class with their new plan, a plan that will save them supposedly $1,000 a year. Gary Cohn the chief economic advisor of Trump has uh, told the press this. If we allow a family to keep another thousand dollars of their income, what does that mean? They can renovate their kitchen. They can buy a new car. They can take a family vacation. They can increase their lifestyle on a thousand dollars a year. In, in what century does this millionaire think we're living in? But for a minute, forget about how much you might get or might not get under Trump's tax cut plan. Think about how much the government will be starved of funds and what that will mean. There'll have to be cutbacks. Trump is not going to cut back the Pentagon, so he's going to cut back FEMA and veterans benefits and OSHA job safety inspectors and incentives for green industry and money for the disabled and on and on and on. Think of all the services Americans will lose under this Trump starve the government plan. Now, an observation about the Take a Knee campaign, which is trying to dramatize the situation, the number of out of control police and minorities are getting killed. Now, a number of National Football League owners are showing various levels of support. But reports are saying that some NASCAR owners are making threats against any of their people who show support for the Take a Knee campaign. The owners claim to be in horror over any disrespect 
to the flag. Yet, as Shane Morris points out, NASCAR events often have Confederate flags flying freely. The Confederates, as you might recall, tried to break up the USA, and their civil war caused 750,000 Americans to die. Now, isn't that a little bit more disrespecting the country than bending a knee? Shane Morris tweets at I am Shane Morris. Now, the owners and athletes may feel differently. Here's a tweet from one of the top retired NASCAR drivers, Dale Earnhardt Jr., expressing report, support for the campaign. He quotes JFK as saying that those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. Here's a bit of update about the campaign to get the University of New Haven to cancel its program to help the Saudi Arabian King Fahd Security College, or as journalist Scott Harris put it, to give aid to police in a police state. UNH has not bothered to reply to any of the nearly 50 signers of the letter to them asking them to cancel the program, though it was sent to them by email and the Postal Service. A petition from the general public has been started and now has a couple hundred signers. To see what's going on, go to our website or directly to SaudiUS.org. Finally, a tribute to the legendary New Haven activist Mary Johnson, who died in August at age 95. She was a teacher, a rank-and-file union leader, a big supporter of the farm workers' union and their boycotts, and active in a whole host of organizations, from the Middle East Crisis Committee to People Against Injustice to the Progressive Action Roundtable. She took part in all the teacher strikes in New Haven and was the only woman to have been put in jail twice for having done so. I interviewed her for a program called It's Radical in 1994. Uh, there were 15 of us originally. Um, we were hauled into court about three times and at on the third and final visit to the courthouse, uh, one of the members had developed some physical ailment, so she was excused, and uh, 14 of us were sent to jail. 13 of them were men, and they were sent to the old pre-Civil War Whaley Avenue Jail, which was an absolute horror, and I was brought to Niantic. Uh, which is the women's prison in Connecticut. What did you feel at that time? The only woman all by, all by herself brought to jail? I, I remember feeling good about it in, in some ways, and I also was a little apprehensive because I had three children at home, one of whom was 11 and was very upset about my involvement. And... I was fearful that I wouldn't even be able to contact her to tell her what was happening. Uh, actually, I did manage it, but I had to make a public display in order to get my phone call. As they were taking me down the stairs in the courthouse, I began demanding my phone call because the judge had promised that we could do that. Mm -hmm. And the uh, sheriffs or whoever they were uh, didn't want to budge, but I began shouting about it so that everybody turned around to look and they were somewhat embarrassed so they let me go to a phone booth and I called my daughter. So here you went to jail for the union in those days and for the teachers and for education. Did you feel it was worth it at the time? Oh absolutely, absolutely and I would have done it again which I did do later on. <laughs>
Uh, where would we be without those strikes? Back in the dark ages. I mean, the days of uh, being patted on the head and not getting any real rewards. Um, it it's, oh, it certainly was worth it. They never would have budged, particularly this Board of Education. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.